today the, the reading from the lectionary is actually from the book of Revelation. And for those of you in my Sunday school class, you know this is one of the very few Sundays that the book of Revelation is part of the lectionary. It's not, it doesn't happen a whole lot. And then the other thing I hope is that people in my class, when they've been listening to the songs, that they have heard the book of Revelation being being sung through there so that's a, that's a good thing because it's a very visual and it uh, a book and it's one that you hear and you see so that's a good one so revelation 7 verses 9 through 17 after this i looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? Who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Uh, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are those who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Thank you, Scott. May God bless the reading of the word this morning. Good day. It's a great day. I am excited to be back to the lectionary. I've been telling you I've been off the lectionary for two months uh, preaching a series, a topical series, and I'm glad today to be back on the lectionary, but I'm already cheating. I'm already cheating because I'm not preaching the Sunday text this week. So my first week back to the lectionary, and I'm not as honest as I want you to think I am. But I chose a lection... Uh, passage. I chose the text from All Saints or All Souls Day, which is November the 1st, the day after Halloween, which happens to have been yesterday. So if you'll just sort of rewind 24 hours with me, we'll be back on the lectionary and on the day we're supposed to be. But I wanted to preach uh, All Saints Day because I hope you had a great Halloween. I hope you had a great uh, October as we got everything kicked off here with, um, with our Fall Fest and we worked together with Bethany Village Live. It was great. It's been Halloween for a while. And they've been advertising and selling candy in all the stores. And some people say, I hate how the holidays arrive early or how, how merchants and retailers usher in the holidays early and earlier every year. But this year, I didn't hate it. One of the reasons I didn't hate it is because I like candy. And so I got a lot of candy during October. I, I don't mind the candy aisle being right up front. It doesn't bother me a bit. And I like Christmas, and I'm not offended at all that the Christmas aisles are open. As a matter of fact, i got to tell you this. <clears throat> you know, I've been talking about it, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. In December, we're going to take sabbatical. That's because uh, you have approved me for that. I've earned that time. I've got four weeks I'm eligible for. This is my first year of eligibility, by the way. So don't tell your teenage kids that the pastor's setting a terrible example. In my first year of eligibility, rather than letting it build up into something, I've got like this $20 bill burning a hole in my pocket, baby. I'm, I want my four weeks now. But I'm going to tell you why. Because Shannon and I, 22 years ago, December the 6th, were married here in Texas. And we took our vacation and our honeymoon trip at Christmas time into the Great Smoky Mountains. And we were in Gatlinburg together. And if you have never been to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, in the Great Smoky Mountains in December and at Christmas time, it's like candy land. Everything is decorated. There's lights on everything. It was such a romantic place to be. We had a shoestring budget, and it was probably the greatest honeymoon trip we could have. It was just too short. 
And in 22 years, we have never been back to the Smoky Mountains during December or Christmas time again. Now, for the last 15 years, we've been in ministry. And it's impossible to get away uh, in December except for this wonderful gesture that you and, and we have made toward each other this year. And so it's going to happen. Shannon, all of our married life together has had this dream uh, trip. This dream Christmas was a Christmas in the Smoky Mountains where she could have all of her family and all of her friends around her. And so it was for many, many years nothing more uh, than a fantasy that maybe someday, you know, and this year. We started planning this a year ago. And this year, it, it, it happens, but not without a touch of somberness, okay? There's a little bit of soberness involved. Uh, all of our kids won't be able to be there. And um, Shannon's mother and her grandmother, as you well know, uh, were both taken from her in a tragic accident in, a month ago. And so uh, neither uh, will they be there. But so we're going to go, and we're going to have a great trip. It's going to be exactly what God had planned for us. It's not just a vacation. We have planned a sabbatical renewal experience around this. And so to get that whole thing started, I've been using the aisles at Dollar General. You know, there's one right down the street from the church. If you come by here and I'm not here, check Dollar General and see if my van is out front. Because I go down there two or three times a week, and, um, and I've been in there buying diapers and and all these fun things, you know, with a new grandbaby close by. And every time I go in, I like to go down that Christmas aisle for two reasons. One, I could use a little jolt of Christmas spirit a little early this year. I really would like to have that. The other is um, I know that my wife needs that. And so I, I, I go down that aisle and I find these little $1 and $2 and sometimes 5 and $10 items, but they're worth every penny. Uh, Tell me what this is. Come on. What is it? Bear. It's a teddy bear, yeah. And I have two of them. They both say 2014 on them. They're Christmas bears, you see. I bought them for Shannon so that we could go on this trip together. And these little bears, I guess they represent me and her, okay? But they're going on the trip with us. They've started already. They're hanging out on desks and by the bed and in different places. And so here they are getting ready for their trip. Teddy bears are uh, something that we've... Seen for a long When I held that up, you knew exactly what it was. You know, who knows where the teddy bear originated? Do you? Because I don't. I'm glad you do. Tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it became the teddy bear. Okay. So a story about Teddy Roosevelt. Right. Teddy Roosevelt adopting a bear cub, and that becomes known as the teddy bear, I guess. And he was what? Uh, around 1900, the dawn of the 20th century. Wouldn't that have been his term or his time of being? How many of you knew that story? A few of you did, and a few of you didn't. For those who didn't, you still knew what this was, right? It was still a teddy bear. You just didn't know why it was a teddy bear. But you know all your life, people hold that up, and you say, well, now that's a teddy bear. Gosh, gee, Doug, everybody knows that. So let's get a little tougher. Tell me what this is. It's a reindeer, but come on. It's not just any reindeer. Look at the nose. It's Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. Another really cute little $1 Christmas item. That probably cost me five bucks, but still. It's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. What do you know about Rudolph? Nose glows? <laughs> yeah. He saved Christmas. What is it? He led the way when Christmas almost didn't happen. When did Rudolph come out? The father wrote the story for his daughter. That was a long time ago. In the 50s, Johnny Marks, or even the 30s, I think, had a hit song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. How many of you in my age group grew up watching that show, that claymation. Look, every hand in the house goes up. It ain't Christmas till they show Rudolph. Yeah, we still watch it. Same one. It ain't Christmas till they show Rudolph, right? Uh, and that's just, that's more recent. I mean, we didn't know where teddy bears came from, but we knew where Rudolph. Uh, we've been watching. What, what is this? this is a little Rudolph's girlfriend. <laughs> I'm going to check, check your manness now. I'm going to see how much of a chauvinist you are. What's her name? You don't even know her name. It's just girlfriend. Don't say it. I do know it. It's Prancer or Vixen. It's Prancer or No, it's not. It's Clarice. You read Scott's lips a minute. Oh, okay. It's Clarice. It is Rudolph's girlfriend. And so like the two teddy bears, I bought these for my wife to put on the desk so... Um, Hopefully, 
Rudolph will save Christmas, right? Again. I mean, we need some help here. We need some help. I got one more. Uh, this is more fun than you guys ever thought it would be. And you didn't even know it was going to happen. What is this? It's not a teddy bear. It's a polar bear. <laughs> well, it is a teddy bear. It's a stuffed... Wait a minute. I thought I'd make the bear rap. <laughs> what does a polar bear have to do with Christmas? Coca-Cola ads, right. When did that happen? The teddy bear happened 100 years ago. Rudolph happened 50 years ago. Polar bears became associated with Christmas because of Coca-Cola ads in the last, what, 10, 15 years at the most, right? But when you saw this polar bear, you knew right away it was about Christmas. It made sense that the polar bear was singing a Christmas song, didn't it? Right? Things are hard at my house. Things are difficult at my house. We are living with that statistic that uh, adolescence has been pushed back to 25 years of age, and we have children at home who are learning how to raise children, and we are in the struggle with them. Our house has been attacked by drug abuse like a lot of your households have and we are living with that and y'all know the story I don't have to go into any detail and then you know what happened to Shannon a month ago and to our family and for me to bring these little images see, these are fun things teddy bears reindeers things that bring back happy memories and I'm gonna tell you what they're doing for us every time I bring one of those back from that aisle down there at Dollar General Every time I walk in the office with one of those, they're reminders to Shannon of a whole nother reality. Right now we live in this period of time where we're working very hard to bring things together. We have one month before time to be gone, and being gone for a month is a chore, folks. So you try it. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not like taking a week or two to go on vacation. Well, You've got to be gone. Marilyn's nodding her head because they're gone for long periods of time. It's work. It's work to get ready, and it's work in the midst of suffering, depression. My household is dealing with depression like a lot of yours is. Be brave. Say it. If you're depressed and you're mentally ill, get some help, will you? Please go stand in the trauma center for 14 hours if you have to, but please let them know you're here and you need help. Please, and let someone else know. Alan came over yesterday and repaired a piece of guttering at my house, and I told him that's worth three or four pills for depression right there because now when I drive up I don't see a house falling down I see a house in repair and I think before I walk through the door I have an investment here you see you see how that works it's beautiful so I'm using these little symbols that remind us of fun fuzzy warm things teddy bears Rudolph polar bears to remind Shannon that though we live in one reality right now there is another reality and that reality is that in December we're going to Candyland, and we're going to celebrate. And there will be some people missing and some pieces missing. And you know what? I can't change that reality. I can't buy enough stuffed animals to make that different. But I can certainly help remind her and myself that that's not the only reality. It's not the only game out there. There's a whole other reality, and it's, 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 it exists right alongside our suffering. And we're not waiting for it in the future. And we don't have to look behind us to claim it. It's right here in this moment. And these little symbols are that reality. You know, Philip Yancey is one of my favorite authors. And Philip Yancey has written a lot of things about the life of Jesus. And someone once asked Philip Yancey, why don't you write anything about the second coming of Christ? And he said this. He said, you know, there were scholars and, and priests and scribes working for a thousand years to predict the first coming of Christ and none of them got it right. Why would any of us think that we would be any more accurate in the second coming? And so that's his excuse for staying away from um, the passages of eschaton and uh, the passages of apocalypse. And uh, so today um, I'm going to take the other road and I'm going to go down that path and, and see what we can do with this revelation passage today. I want to start with a story about a Buddhist monk who visited the United States once, and Joseph Campbell used to tell this story. The monk stayed here for a while, and he uh, experienced Christianity 
in several different settings. And before he departed, he was asked to summarize what he had learned about Christianity. And this was what one Buddhist monk said about our Western Christian practice. He said this. He said, man against God, God against man. Man against nature, nature against man. God against nature, nature against God. Funny religion. And it is, because it's only in our Western context that we find so much conflict in religion. Holistic faith always sought to reconcile things instead of setting things at edge to one another. But from the readings in Genesis, in the garden with the serpent and the woman and the man and the tree, and you know all those stories, the conflict is described and defined. It's as if these little kids are asking their parents, how do we get in the shape we're in? And they say... Well, let us tell you these familiar stories. Let us use these images again to describe to you. And they, they build this conflict. And if it begins in Genesis, then why not in Revelation that we find um, the reconciliation of the conflict? Why not in Revelation can we not see God in nature, man in nature, God in man reconciled one to another? And so we look for it in the images. Revelation uses familiar images like teddy bears and reindeer, okay? For one thing, the author of Revelation, John the Revelator, borrows apocalyptic literature primarily from the book of Daniel and several other places spotted throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. So he clearly defines himself as someone with a background in the Hebrew Scriptures. And most of his readers, if not all, I'm sure have uh, some sense of what those images are about. They come, where they come from and what they mean to them. They invoke certain uh, emotions and certain thoughts and certain feelings within them. Apocalyptic images, all borrowed from Hebrew culture. And at the same time, John the Revelator will borrow... Uh, other images from pagan religions, other sayings from pagan religions, such as the saying over the temple to Zeus that says Zeus is the Alpha, Zeus is the Omega. And it's here in Revelation that John, the author, writes that God is the, the Omega. God is the Alpha. It is not Zeus, but it is in fact God. And so the author borrows imagery and language from current religion in their culture. The author also borrows scenes from everyday life. Rob Bell talks about um, how that Domitian would address the provinces of Asia Minor from a throne and then a choir of elders would sing to Domitian and, and then there would be a horse race in his honor. And so there are images borrowed from daily life, from coronation ceremonies, from, from celebrations, from, from festivals that are part of these people's day-to-day -day life and why not? If John, the author who wrote this great letter of Revelation, were a student and a disciple of Jesus, why wouldn't he use images that were familiar from everyday life? Because that's exactly how Jesus taught when Jesus taught his disciples. Okay? I think another thing that we really need to have a, a concept of is who is reading this letter. Revelation is not a book. It wasn't written uh, as a book. It's not a comic book. It's not a fill in the, the pictures with your favorite psychedelic colors. It's not a mad magazine. It is a letter. You've got mail. That's how I preached this sermon several years ago. You've got mail. And so the congregation reads this letter in its entirety. But who are these people? In 64 A.D., stay with me, 64, Mark's gospel is written at around 50 and then in 64 A.D., Nero, the emperor of Rome, made Christianity a capital offense. So in 64 A.D., this is like 34 years or 30 years maybe after Jesus has died, uh, it becomes a crime against the state to be a practicing follower of Jesus, of the way or Christianity as we know it or call it today. Around 90 A.D., 90, which is uh, like 26 years later, uh, or maybe 27 or 28, but somewhere after 90 A.D., this letter uh, of Revelation by John the Revelator uh, it surfaces and they begin to read it. It's 30 years that it's been a crime. 
to be a Christian. Can't you understand and hear people in that great congregation saying to themselves, what has happened here? People are dying. I think that Revelation in one sense is written to encourage people because of the uh, suffering at hand. But I think a more important point is to answer a question. What has happened to these people that have died, that have been persecuted? What has happened? Has Jesus failed us? Has God failed us? And the text and the letter begins to unfold one blessing after another to explain a different reality that exists alongside the reality that the people are living in at the time. And that reality is this, that the scene you read about today is quite simply for those people, it's not complicated, it is the redemption of the church. It is the scene where God redeems those who are persecuted and who are faithful. It is that, simply put, for someone in, in 90 A.D., this is the redemption picture of the church. And it's not a real hopeful thing. It is to hope in God. But if someone came up to you today and said, well, just hang in there, because when you're finally dead, God will reward you for all the suffering you're doing, that's a hard message to hear. And sometimes it may be the only message we have, but it's not easy. This, this letter surfaces around 90 A.D. It's been a crime against the state for 30 years to be a Christian. And then I want you to realize that the persecution continues until 311 A.D. That is 220 more years. If this letter were supposed to give people hope that this persecution would end soon, it fails in its purpose. Because the persecution won't end for another 200 years. And no one in 90 A.D. has any way of knowing that. And reading this letter does not give them any hints or clues that it is going to continue. One of the biggest dangers about this text today is our, our willingness to say to people, it's the situation God has you in. And it'll get better. Again, if that's the only hope we have, that's the hope we cling to. But how many times have we stood with resources available to help in a situation and we say, we can't help you, but God will reward you for your suffering. I don't know if that's a responsible use of the message in this text in our current context. I want you to know that the people who read that lived in a, in a culture that was... Uh, not just heavily, but, but completely influenced by uh, Plato. And what they believed was that the world existed in three firmaments, the heavens, the earth, and the under-earth, and they believed that there was a place in the heavens where everything that's happening on earth is lived out in a spiritual realm and that the two were mirroring each other. And so it's not hard for them to make these statements about this reality in, in heaven's throne room. Are you with me? But we live in a culture that knows now. We've been beyond this uh, atmosphere. We know that the world is not made up of three firmaments and no one in any religion now that I'm aware of believes that heaven has a, a, a screen playing out every scene that's acted out on the earth in a spiritual realm. Therefore, we can no longer hold to an, an erroneous interpretation of any text based on what we know to be true about God and the universe today. But there's a picture in here that I do like. And it's this, that around that throne there are angels and there are beasts. And these beasts represent, as most historians and theologians will tell you, the kingdoms of this earth. Maybe the Babylonian Empire, maybe the Persian Empire, maybe the Roman Empire. Some say even the American Empire to come, which would be fascinating. But no question that they represent the kingdoms of this earth. And the angels around that throne earlier in the text are described as the four angels at the corners of the earth who hold back the winds. Do you know what that means? It means that the kingdoms of this earth and even the weather, all things oppressive, dangerous, and unpredictable are bowed around the throne of God. So the next time someone says, why do people die in a hurricane? I don't know. 
But I know that the four angels around the throne say to me that whatever this conflict that Genesis describes, where God and nature are at odds with each other, there's a scene in the throne room that says they are reconciled. That when the kingdoms of this earth are described as anti-Christ or against God, there's a scene in the throne room where the kingdoms of this earth are bowed down before the very throne of God. Who are the ones in the white robes? That's the question asked in the text. Who are the ones in the white robes? There's another familiar image from that day, and I want you to get this. Elders in, in the time that would sing to Domitian around the throne were the people uh, who had achieved who had conquered. These were generals and politicians and governors. Maybe one day in his old age, Pontius Pilate is one of the elders around the throne and he no longer has to rule in Palestine and he no longer has to manage the violence or make decisions about people's lives. He's retired. He sings around the throne of Domitian at special events and he is a very well-respected man from the community. And some who criticized him might say, because they all wear white robes, you understand, and some might say, that's Pontius Pilate, and his robe is dipped in the blood of Palestinians, dipped in the blood of Jews. Whoever that particular person had a hand in conquering or oppressing, it might be said as a piece of criticism, that robe is dipped in someone else's blood. And here... In this great scene, they say those in the white robes have dipped them and been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb. Who's on the throne? God. And who? The Lamb. Dipped in the blood of the Lamb. What does that look like? I suspect it looks like what Shannon read earlier. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those... Uh, who are persecuted for my sake because you're being formed in righteousness. You see, to be dipped in the blood of the Lamb and to wear that white robe of the Lamb is to be as emptying in self as Jesus gave us the ability and the example to be. To give oneself away for someone else. And that is how we find ourselves on the throne, in the midst of the throne. You know, um, a few years ago, I went through some really uh, good counseling. And um, one lady talked to me about uh, problems with my kids. You know, as, as my children became teenagers, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep a handle on being a parent. And, and my statement at the time was, I think that of all the things in my life, I think that I feel the, like the biggest failure as a parent. That I think that as a parent, I have, I have not done well. And so this wonderful counselor helped me do some digging. And she said, you know, I, she took this statement. When my children were little, they loved me best. Shannon will tell you that's the truth right now. She knows they loved me best. And they would always want to be where I was and do what I do. And dad was great. Dad was great. And then when they became teenagers, I was the worst parent in the world. And my counselor took my background and said, you know, here's a little boy that was raised by his grandparents who put me up on this pedestal over and over. There's nothing I could do wrong. And I got good at it. It helped form me. It's why I want to be the singer, the guitar player, the preacher. And it's not a bad thing if I don't sell out to it. But in my children's lives, this wonderful woman explained, they put you up on that pedestal. You were their hero until they became teenagers. And then they did what all teenagers do. Whatever is on that pedestal comes down and they go up on it. You, you laugh because you did it too. <laughs> I did it, you did it, and, and, and every generation has. Richard Rohr would say it's not evil. It's, it, 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 they're getting their uh, careers, they're getting their homes, they're building their fortunes, and they're building up the ego, and you've got to have a nice big one to die to later if you want to get this thing right. So let them do it. Tony Campolo would say, why are you surprised by that? You knew they were going to do it. You knew it was coming. Why did it take you by surprise? They're children. They're supposed to rebel. But this woman unlocked for me this secret that, you know, I'm not a bad parent. It's, I didn't understand what to do when I wasn't on that pedestal anymore, when I wasn't at the center of their life, when I wasn't on that throne. It became difficult. 
Philip Yancey interviewed Henry Nowen. Some of you know who Nowen is. He's a great, um, great priest, a great author, uh, a wounded healer in his own words. And uh, a great lecturer, a great teacher. He had taught, I think, at Harvard and at many great universities. Wrote a lot of books. At the end of Henry Nowen's life, he spent every day of his life at a community in Toronto called the Daybreak Community where he gave care to a quadriplegic man named Michael, a man whose mind was so badly uh, damaged and distorted that he couldn't even learn Henry's name. He could never even say thank you to Nowen for changing his dirty pants or feeding him or bathing him. He would never know how to even say thank you. And when Philip Yancey interviewed now, and he asked the obvious question, he said, with someone with your potential to teach and to reach so many people, why is it that you hole up here away from everyone and you give your whole life to this one person who will never be able to say thank you for the blessing? And now and looked at Yancey and he said, you misunderstand. You, you have not correctly interpreted my relationship with Michael. You see, it's not about him. It's me. The blessing is mine. And I think Henry Nowen had unlocked something that so many of us search for. But he had learned that to dip your robe in the blood of that lamb to give yourself away. And, and, and the more unconditional, the better. It's not unconditional love until someone doesn't deserve it. It's not good enough till they can't say thank you. Sometimes. And I think that Nowen had found a way to clearly know who was on that throne and to bow everything in his life around that throne of God where the Lamb is seated. When Shannon and I uh, were in Alabama, we were getting ready for Mom's funeral and grandma's funeral and no one was talking a lot i don't know what day it was it was before either service and we sat around on on the porch mostly all we could do is cry but then we started singing we sing like this and i will worship you, Lord, only you, Lord, and I will bow down before you, only you, Lord. Sometimes, sometimes we sang because we wanted to call God out and we wanted to throw down, and sometimes we just needed to say, God, uh, you're it. I'm going to keep you on the throne because in that moment, the temptation to worship the pain was immense. The temptation to put our situation on the throne and expect others to bow to that was enormous. The chance of losing hope was real. And so we filled our mouths with the right words. We'll worship you, God, and only you, even when we don't know the answers and even when it's hard and even when we walk, what we want to say is shame on you. We will put you on that throne again where you are already and worship you, God. And we were honest enough to sing like, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, Lord, how I need you. Oh, man, did we need God now. You should have been there that day. It was great. It was worship. It got us ready so that by the time we got to the funeral, we were able to sing it and mean it when we sang it. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know what I want you to do with this text? When other people are describing frightening and scary things to come, which may or may not happen, try not to be afraid. 
Try not to be afraid. When you're looking for an escape or, an, or a way out, try not to depend on this passage. Just say to God, you're Lord, you're God, no matter what comes, no matter where I am, no matter how left behind or taken up I may be, you are God. Try not to be afraid. Help people when you can. You know, it is true that God will reconcile all things. And it is true that God will reward all. And it is true that God uh, will embrace all. Also true that sometimes God put you or me right in somebody's path because we were able to help today. And a text is much more powerful when it's about today and not about 200 or 2,000 years from now. And the last thing, um, if you haven't already done it and you're over 25 or 30 years old, would you try to start living your life for something besides yourself? If you need some help with that, you can come ask me or there are several other people around this place that have finally figured out how to let go and let that happen. And then after that, God be on that throne right there with that lamb. What could be less threatening? To God be the glory. Will you pray with me?